I was born September 9th or 10th, 1958, in Long Beach, California. Um, there's still some debate about when I was actually born. Um, my birth certificate indicates September 10th, but my mother always celebrated my birthday on the 9th. My parents were from New Mexico and Texas. My uh, grandparents uh, settled in New Mexico, and my father's family uh, have New Mexican roots going back to the 17th century. Uh, but again, I was born in Long Beach, California. My parents moved out to California after uh, the Korean War to seek employment and be closer to family uh, who had come out to Los Angeles uh, looking for work. Um, I was raised in the parish of St. Peter and St. Paul in Wilmington, California, where I grew up. And that's the oldest uh, non-missionary parish in Los Angeles, dating back to uh, 1854. It's a lovely parish and a beautiful church, uh, and it was filled with all sorts of exquisite artwork, stained glass windows and sculptures and reliefs. And so um, I was raised in a beautiful um, art-filled parish that inspired me um, to be an artist, to paint images of the saints. My mother and I used to attend a novena to Our Lady of Perpetual Help uh, every Wednesday at this particular church. And there was a chapel dedicated to Our Lady of Perpetual Help that included a beautifully hand-carved relief of the Blessed Mother that was gilded and beautifully colored. And uh, they also had uh, holy cards of Our Lady of Perpetual Help. And during the novena service, they would bring out a beautiful icon of the Blessed Mother under that particular title. Uh, and so it would be displayed during the prayers uh, that were held for the novena. And when I would go home, I would sketch images of the saints and the particular of Our Lady of Perpetual Help. Um, Later on, when, when I became uh, more interested in um, the, th the lives of the saints themselves, I would go to the, the library, which was very close to the church, uh, and take out books of the saints, uh, initially to read the lives of the saints and to know their stories, but they were often accompanied with, by images of the saints, and that's when I became interested in iconography in addition to hagiography. My father uh, was a Matachinas dancer, uh, and um, he would talk about that dance tradition when we were young, uh, usually at dinner. And uh, as he described the dance and the costumes that were worn for that particular dance, he often would sketch. And so I was fascinated by my father's sketching. Um, and so I was inspired to sketch because my father was such a, a lively artist himself, but it was actually my, my older brother, Joe, who uh, took his interest in art to uh, a level of formal training. Uh, and so he began to study art, and he would bring uh, his work home, and I was just in awe of it, and it was something that I wanted to do. So I was both inspired by my father, Joe, and my brother, Joe, uh, who uh, had a great interest and talent in, in art. As I attended um, weekly uh, devotions to Our Lady of Perpetual Help with my mom, and I became more versed uh, in, in the lives of the saints and the iconography associated with them, um, my interest in um, becoming more um, familiar and um, attached to my faith grew at the same time. Um, and again, as I studied the lives of the saints, uh, I came across the story of St. Francis. And that was about the time that I was preparing for my confirmation. And so when I finally uh, was confirmed, I took the name of, of Francis as my confirmation name. Um, and over the years that followed, um, and, I, and I became more familiar with the life of St. Francis, uh, um, I, I had thoughts of entering the priesthood and eventually becoming a Franciscan. After graduation from high school, um, I went off to Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut. And um, while I was there, 
I would attend the Dominican Church of St. Mary's in New Haven. And this particular parish was where the Knights of Columbus was founded. And they had a lovely bookstore, which was run by a Franciscan monk. And so my interest in hagiography and the saints and the Franciscan life continued even after high school. Um, I transferred from, from Yale to UCLA um, in the early 80s. And um, uh, while I was at UCLA, I pursued my interest in art history. And that kept on taking me back to um, images of the saints. After I graduated uh, from UCLA and I got my degree in history and then later on a master's in education, um, my interest in New Mexico returned to me. Uh, I remembered the stories that my father used to tell and um, I visited a friend who was roommate at Yale who was from Santa Fe and so um, I came to New Mexico for the first time on my own about 1981-1982 uh, to visit him and while I was out here I fell in love again with um, the spirit of New Mexico, the geography, the landscape, the history, the culture. And so when I returned to Los Angeles, um, I thought I would um, continue my research into uh, the way santos were depicted in New Mexico. Uh, and so I began a study of New Mexican santos and I began to paint them. As I began to study um, 19th century New Mexican santos and santo painting, um, I also began to participate in the Spanish market. And this is how I got in, uh, became familiar and acquainted with um, some of the great New Mexican Santo Pedro painters such as Charlie Carrillo and Alcario Otero who are among my, my favorites. And uh, I admired what they were doing both in terms of um, original research so that they could uh, create images in the 20th century, in the 21st century, that were their own work, but were firmly rooted in the tradition. And so I credit Charlie Carrillo and Gary Otero and others uh, with um, being pioneers uh, in, in the research into New Mexican Santo so that their own work was genuine and authentic and was founded on uh, what they learned and knew about 19th century work. I wanted to do that as well. Studying the work on hand um, led me to remain devoted to the depiction of the saints in a very simple way. Uh, New Mexican santos from the 19th century really are, are essentially cartoons. They're line, simple line drawings um, with color and there's some decoration. Uh, but basically they're, they're very simple and uh, I liken them to orthodox icons in, in the fact that uh, there's no real attempt at uh, you know, what I call Renaissance realism, you know, the tricks of perspective, shadowing, and, and, and anatomy, and so on. Um, and so when I paint the saints, and when, when I look at the saints painted by people like Charlie and, and Alcario, what I admire about them uh, is the simplicity, remaining true to what I consider, you know, the hallmark of 19th century New Mexican work, a great simplicity of line and color, which allows, in my opinion, the spirituality of the particular uh, saint to come out. But when I do paint an image of a santo, uh, I really want to make it within the context of the New Mexican tradition. Um, there are any number of ways one can depict a saint, a santo. I choose very specifically to paint in the New Mexican tradition, uh, partly because I have New Mexican roots. You know, as I mentioned earlier, uh, um, both sides of my family have roots here in New Mexico. And when I was uh, a boy, we would come out by train or station wagon every five years to Texas and New Mexico for a wedding or a funeral. And really that's when I uh, became attached and, and uh, responded to the landscape and the culture here. And so I was very intent upon painting images of the saints in the New Mexican tradition and style. Uh, and of course, as I, I taught myself how to paint, I also taught myself um, what made a New Mexican santo New Mexican. Um, and so in, in the course of my study, um, I learned that you depict a New Mexican saint in one way and not in another. And although I have tweaked the tradition 
of various times throughout my, my career as a New Mexican Santero, I find myself coming back to what I consider um, the hallmarks of, of New Mexican Santo painting. I do have favorites, and I like to call them the top ten, and you know, okay. that would include, of course, St. Francis and Our Lady of Guadalupe, uh, St. Michael, San Rafael, San Gabriel, um, many images, any advocations of the Blessed Mother uh, are among my favorites, um, and of course, most recently, San Pasquale. Um, for the past 20 years, I had painted primarily uh, for a Spanish market in Santa Fe, uh, which is the largest Hispanic market of art in the United States, not only of uh, Santos, but a wide variety of, of, of art material, media, and so on. So primarily my, my audience um, were patrons of Santos at Spanish market. Um, I often received commissions um, from folks who could not attend Spanish market or who had purchased my work from Spanish market before and wanted something else. So even outside of Spanish market, primarily my patrons were those who were familiar with New Mexican retablos, their particular style and their history, uh, and who were also devoted to a particular saint. Um, in, in the years that I showed at Spanish market, I took great pleasure in engaging my patrons in conversation. I often asked them, well, why, why this particular image? And, and I would say just as many responded that they were uh, interested in a particular saint out of a devotion, uh, usually deriving from that saint's area of patronage, cooking in San Pasqual, for example, um, and also uh, an interest in the art form itself and in Spanish market retablos as a continuation of an ancient art form that's very unique to New Mexico. Some were interested in the images solely as, a, as an element of home decor, and that was fine with me. My attitude is that you know, I paint an image out of devotion and love, out of an interest in continuing the tradition uh, that was founded here in New Mexico. And once it's painted and falls into the hands of another person, uh, I have no control over, over how that particular image is used or, or viewed. And that's okay with me. I think there will always be an interest uh, in the saints. There will always be an interest in depicting the saints. Artists uh, will, will create images of the, of the saints in many different media, many different styles. I think the New Mexican tradition is firmly established here. Um, as we know, it was um, uh, in danger of being lost at the turn of the century due to the popularity um, of mass-produced images. And uh, thankfully, uh, folks like um, um, Frank Applegate, uh, in their interest in preserving a Hispanic tradition, uh, brought that tradition uh, back to life. And through the efforts of the Spanish Colonial Art Society and the Museum of Spanish Colonial Art, Spanish Market, and all the artists like Charlie and Alcario and, and others, um, the tradition will remain here in New Mexico as part of New Mexican history and culture. And so people who discover New Mexico and, and become enchanted with it will have an interest in New Mexican Santos, uh, both from the 19th century and the work that continues to be created by contemporary Santeros. I think um, now that contemporary artists have embraced the idea of innovation within tradition, um, and feel free to uh, tweak the tradition, um, they will continue to do so. I think they will also continue to look back at traditional forms, traditional images, as their inspiration, as the foundation of their inspiration. Um, I don't think the tradition will die or stagnate uh, because great breakthroughs have been made, first and foremost, in the minds of artists themselves. Uh, here in New Mexico, Santeros and Santeras, uh, who have realized that uh, they can participate in a tradition uh, and innovate within that tradition, uh, exercise their own artistic um, skills and, and inspiration to create 
new images that are based on older ones. Um, and that it's okay to copy as well. You know, copying for a long time had been so discouraged. Um, but it's, in my own experience, it's a very valuable way of entering into the spirit of the original. And in this case, the, the originals are 19th century New Mexican santos, created at a particular time and place and purpose, uh, which has great value and has uh, a place in continuing to inspire contemporary artists. Before I was asked to participate in the show, um, I knew just about as much as most people know about San Pasqual, that he's a patron of cooking and kitchens and so on. But as I began to do my research into San Pasqual himself, and I learned more about uh, who he was as a Franciscan, I became more intrigued with this person as an individual. Um, he was born in 1540 uh, in Spain to very poor parents. Uh, he was uh, very devote, devout uh, at, at a very early age. He, uh, he taught himself to read and write. Uh, he was a shepherd and a herdsman uh, and initially um, wanted to join the Franciscan order and was encouraged to join the Reformed Franciscan Order. In fact, before he entered the Franciscan Order, he was known in his local uh, community um, as the Holy Shepherd. Uh, and then soon after he died, there were miracles that were attributed to him. In fact, he was canonized before St. Peter of Alcantara, who actually founded the order that he joined later on. And so, San Pascual had this unique distinction of being popular among the people and acclaimed as a holy person among the people, and also in the hierarchy in the official church. Um, he was beatified in 1680 and then canonized in 1690, but it wasn't until uh, the latter part of the 19th century, 1897, that he was formally declared patron of Eucharistic adoration congresses and conferences. So what was his appeal between the time of uh, well, while he was alive and his, his death, uh, to the time he was made patron of Eucharistic adoration. Um, it came from people's direct knowledge of him as a holy person. Uh, and then the church um, embracing him uh, in 1618 as a, be as a beatified person in the church with official portraits created of him. And they always focused on his adoration of the Eucharist, which of course was the foundation of uh, the Reformation in the Catholic Church in the 16th and century, 17th century. And so I see San Pascual really uh, originally as being um, a, a patron and an image of uh, a renewed missionary zeal based on um, the, the dogma of uh, the Eucharist uh, as a foundation of, of, of Catholic belief. So I'm very intrigued by uh, the presence of San Pascual brought to Mexico in the 16th century by reformed Franciscans. Um, and I discovered that there is a 17th century tile mural of San Pascual in the, the Church of St. Francis in Tepeyanco, uh, Tlaxcala. Uh, and I, I, my personal belief is this particular depiction of San Pascual in this kitchen setting might be one of the great sources for his iconography in Mexico. We know that um, uh, he was depicted in 19th century laminas, uh, paintings of santos, uh, usually done in oil on tin um, panels that came out of, out of Mexico during the 19th century. And the heyday of, of, of laminas or retablos painted on, on tin. Uh, um, this came uh, at the same time that the liberal constitution of Mexico in 1857 was passed and uh, there began a ruthless suppression of the church uh, during um, the middle of the 19th century to the very end, uh, including what we call the Porfiriato, the period during which President Porfirio Diaz uh, um, was president of Mexico. So there was a suppression of the church at the same time that these oil paintings on tin became extremely popular. And so my, my feeling is that while the official church was suppressed, um, popular devotion began to express itself in the home. And so we have images of San Pascual showing up 
they were never quite as popular as Our Lady of Refuge or Our Lady of Guadalupe or the Sacred Heart or even the Mano Poderoso, but they were present. And um, uh, because of the suppression of the church, my feeling is that the emphasis on his patronage of Eucharistic adoration, uh, which is a keystone in, in, in the, the dogma of the church, uh, was transferred to the domestic uh, life of, of, of the woman in, in the kitchen. And so there also appears wonderful little songs and prayers um, that were said to San Pasqual, uh, asking for his help in lighting fires in the kitchen, preventing fires in the kitchen, helping with domestic chores in the home. And so there's this transferal, transference of, of San Pasqual as being this grand patron of, of Eustic adoration to being a patron of the home, where uh, religious devotion was secure because it was not in the public arena, a place where um, uh, the government of Mexico uh, was uh, suppressing uh, religious expression. And I have a theory that uh, by the time the golden age of New Mexican retablo painting um, came and went, 1850 or so, um, images of San Pascual painted in Mexico uh, were coming into their own. And so New Mex the popular of New Mexican Santos had already uh, reached its, its apex and had begun to decline by the time images of San Pascual in Mexico itself uh, were just beginning to be created and disseminated. Um, I think that um, uh, San Pascual reappears in New Mexico um, in the, t in the tw 20s, 30s, and 40s um, with uh, the popularization of Harvey House Hotels and uh, images that were created to uh, commercialize and um, advertise um, oh, what Harvey House hotels were doing, which included uh, restaurants and cafes. And so in the 1940s, we see uh, a, a beautiful uh, silk screen by Louis Ewing of San Pasqual, which was used in Harvey House hotel menus. That image itself is almost a direct representation or copy of a tile mural of San Pascual that is in the La Posada Hotel, uh, Har a Harvey House Hotel in Winslow, Arizona. That tile mural itself is almost a direct copy of the 17th century tile depiction of San Pascual in the, in the, San Franc in the St. Francis Church uh, in Tepeyanco that I referenced earlier. I've created other images of San Pasqual, but always in response to the interest in San Pasqual as patron of cooking and kitchens. Uh -huh. uh, and um, um, so when I was invited to do this show uh, by Dr. Te Mariana Nunn, uh, I decided I wanted to um, depict San Pasqual in a way that was more traditional and yet was still somehow uh, related to uh, New Mexican imagery, uh, San Pasqual as a popular New Mexican saint and patron of cooking. Um, so this is where I began to do more research into San Pasqual himself. Here we have my depiction of San Pasqual de Belon. And um, I decided I wanted to do something a little bit different than uh, I normally do. I'm pretty traditional in terms of my uh, depiction of saints in the New Mexican style. Uh, but in this particular case, I wanted to create an image of San Pascual that was an idealized self-portrait of myself. And, and I did that in the spirit of earlier images and paintings of saints where the artist would use a, a, a friend or a family member as the model, and sometimes self-portraits, in fact, as the model uh, for the particular saint. And so here I am depicted uh, in prayer before a representation uh, of the Blessed Sacrament. Uh, because San Pascual, first and for foremost, is a patron of Eucharistic adoration and Eucharistic congresses and conferences. And so I really wanted to create an image that was personal, um, that referenced my own particular devotion, you know, to the Blessed Sacrament. And I guess in that way I saw myself like San Pascual, not so much in the sense of, of being a saintly person, but somebody who uh, drew inspiration from the same source, from their Franciscan spirituality, and from their um, uh, uh, devotion to the Blessed Sacrament as, as a foundation and really a keystone of my own particular faith. 
Um, I didn't want to get too far away, though, from uh, a New Mexican rendering of San Pascual, and so I included uh, an, an image of chilies, a chili ristra hanging in the corner, uh, covered by um, uh, some folded drapery. And then even the shape of the panel itself is a reference to New Mexican santos. So I wanted to incorporate uh, those elements so that I didn't stray too far from uh, a New Mexican image. Uh, the Sacred Heart and the Lunette uh, is a reference to my first name, which is Jesus. Um, my mother um, dedicated me to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, and so um, the image of the Sacred Heart has always been one of my favorites, and I wanted to include that in there. Some, somewhat of a semi-biographical or autobiographical element. Um, I normally do not paint in this somewhat um, um, realistic style, and again, I wanted to do something a little bit different, and so I thought it would be fun to uh, depart from uh, my usually very idealized, almost cartoonish depiction of, of a New Mexican saint. Um, and in fact, when I created this, I also kind of wanted to leave something of a record of myself behind, um, because as you know, um, I have stage four lung cancer, and when I painted this, my diagnosis, my prognosis was still, as, as it remains, um, not very hopeful. I didn't know how long I would have, you know, and I still don't really, uh, to live, to paint, and, and so I thought this would be a great opportunity to do something uh, different, uh, something that honored the saint, but also uh, left a little bit of myself behind. I have been blessed to be able to participate in this tradition of creating santos in the New Mexican tradition. Growing up in California by the beach uh, in a culture and society that was so transient and was so focused on the latest thing, I found a great source of continuity, a great source of spiritual, cultural, ethnic uh, identity in participating in this tradition of New Mexico Santo making. Uh, when I finally moved to New Mexico permanently almost 20 years ago, I became part of a community that was vested in its culture and its history, that was proud about it, uh, that embraced me, uh, that made me feel part of this ancient tradition and this larger community. At the same time, I embraced my own Franciscan vocation. And so my vocation as a Santero in the New Mexican tradition and my vocation as a Franciscan came together here in New Mexico and has sustained me and has allowed me to grow as a person and has allowed me to endure the trials that I have confronted in the wake of my cancer diagnosis. And so I'm very blessed and I'm very grateful. Thank you.